The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Probably one of the most necessary messages, I believe, is understanding uh, discernment. We need it now more than ever. We've always needed it, but I believe we're going to continue to do it. Now, <clears throat> first of all, I'm going to start out with what it's not, all right? Uh, it's not a spirit of suspicion. You can do that without being saved, can't you? That's not hard. Uh, worry. You know, Proverbs 15, 15 says, All the days of the desponding and afflicted are made evil because of anxious thoughts and forebodings. But he who has a glad heart has a continual feast regardless of circumstances. What that's saying is, I want you to picture this. People who are prone to worry and then they call it love. You need to get delivered from that. Worry is not love. Worry is comes from fear, and then emotionally it's fear, but visually when you worry, you are picturing a scenario of what can go wrong. Right? You're projecting an image of what can go wrong. And you can sound like a very concerned person, but if you were really concerned, you would want a redemptive vision for that person, and you would want the eyes of Jesus, but you have to have the heart of Jesus. You cannot have a heart of fear and say you're discerning. It's, just, it's the wrong kingdom. What you see will be so, and as a matter of fact, if you stay in worry, you basically bring it upon yourself, the wrong kingdom. You bring those fears upon you. Those things that you fear, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Both emotionally, it's fear-based, and visually, worry creates an imaginary situation that's negative. The key is always, and this goes for dream interpretation, this goes for prophecy, is where is the redemption? Because if you're speaking truth, and He is truth. He is the way and the truth. He is the way and the reality in the life. If God speaks something to you, there's a redemptive solution. Somewhere there's redemption. If you do not see redemption, it's the wrong kingdom. It can be carnal. It can be fleshly. I can remember the time that I had three dreams of a plane crash. And it had a very positive implication from God. But in the dream, emotionally, I was at peace, not fear. In the plane crash, I came walking out, I went to another level, to another airplane, and to a third airplane. And God gave me the interpretation, and it was redemptive. Okay? So plane crash automatically sounds like, uh oh, something's going to go wrong. And that's the carnal interpretation. That's not discernment, by the way. That's basically just creating an image and going by a fearful feeling and then creating a solution. You know, plugging in an answer. Proverbs 29 18 says, Where there is no redemptive revelation of God, the people perish or they cast off restraint without, without a prophetic revelation, without that which is redemptive. Even when you've heard people uh, uh, chastise people, they say, well, I'm just speaking the truth in love. My first question is, where's the love? <laughs> you can speak the truth in love, but I want to see the love. Where's the redemption in it? If you do not have a solution and you have something negative, then the least case scenario is you should what? Intercede. Bless them that curse you. Pray for them that speak evil of you. Do good to them that hate you. Basically, that's, that's the bottom line of the heart of Jesus. You have to be able to see through the circumstances. And <clears throat> I like this. So uh, when it comes to discernment, 
from the time I was a young Christian, I wanted to understand it, and I had to go to books because even a lot of my peers that were pastors did not really have a handle on, on discernment the way God gifted me when I got filled with the Holy Spirit. But it is not just a gift. It is expected to grow in the individual. The spiritual man discerns all things. That's not a gift. That's a progressive reality. You grow in the discernment as you grow spiritually. So there is both a walk in the spirit and there is the gift of discerning of spirits and there is a discerning of spirits in everyday life. I call it daily discernment. Now, <clears throat> I like it. You say, how do I get there? Well, it's easy. Matthew 6.33 in the message translation. Steep your life. That's like the tea bag that we talk about. Steep your life in God reality. That's intimacy. God initiative. When you discern His presence and you steep yourself in that reality, you get acclimated to His nature. Yeah, that means you feel. You can see when you discern. You see, hear, or feel. Uh, 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 Jim Gall uses the same terminology. He says, see, hear, and know. I... I know in your knower, but that's actually a feeling. And we talked one time in an elevator at a meeting going up and down, and he was just saying, he says, I know I wrote the book on the seer, but I'm a feeler too, just like you. All right? So feeler is a discerning aspect. All inner knowings, let's put it that way, all inner knowings are either seeing, hearing, or feeling primarily. See, hear, or touch. See, hear, or touch. In the spirit, we're not talking carnality. We're talking about seeing redemptively. We're talking about feeling the love of God. And we're talking about knowing, hearing the voice of God. And we've often used that illustration. You know, uh, they had it on Facebook, even a little episode. I just loved it. Where a shepherd would call the sheep and would say certain words. And the sheep would respond like that. Someone else came and said the same exact words and the sheep didn't even lift their heads up from chewing grass. So it's not just saying the same words, it's what's the nature that's on those words. That's what's required of discernment. Come on, some of you have, have noticed that sometimes a person complimented you and it didn't feel right. They might have been trying to compliment you but their heart wasn't really in it, you would discern that. How about this? Here's a simpler version. You're a new, a new believer. You just received Jesus as your personal Savior, and you went to tell somebody about Jesus, because you were all excited, and you felt like the words were falling down. You know what you did? You actually, while you were talking, you were discerning their receptivity. They weren't. They had a wall up. And it feels like your words, it's a feeling, it's a perception that your words are falling to you. But then there's others, you were telling them about Jesus, and it was like, whoa, this is, you're impressing yourself with the revelation. At the same time, you're talking to someone else, you go, and Jesus, whoa, this is really good. You're thinking about, whoa, well, I want to stay here for a long time. You are discerning a response where someone is receiving. Isn't it easier when they receive? <laughs> sure it is. Jesus was the most anointed man that ever walked the face of the earth, and there were people who did not receive. Isn't that something? So it's not a question of an anointing. It's a question of your ability to hear, your ability to receive. There was many who could not mix it with faith, and he could not do much among them. You can't do something with somebody that's not teachable or worse the ones that I already know this. Please, don't get your theology from Facebook either, all right? Now I got the 5,000 friend limit on, on, on my Facebook, but there's a lot of my friends, I would like to take them aside, but you can't do that, and I'm not going to do it on Facebook. But it's horrible theology, horrible. Ugh. You know, you should be a little bit cautious before you post your theology on Facebook. And at least make sure you know what you're talking about. It's embarrassing. 
All right, are you ready? We're going to exercise discernment this morning. And we're going to pray for an impartation for you because it is gifting, but it needs to be developed. And you need to know to this day, I don't know when gifting ends and daily discernment coming from a spiritual relationship starts. But I do know this. It has always been easy for myself and for Jason to pick up duplicity where that's where. Uh, what uh, God says it this way, uh, with their lips they praise me, but their heart is far from me. Man looks at the outward appearance, God looks at the heart. Discernment goes for motive. Now, I want to start with <clears throat> that when I had the dream three times, discernment, 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 I went, all right, God, when I woke up, all right, I will preach discernment next Sunday. Discernment, discernment, discernment. And then I'm saying, why three times? Well, probably so for emphasis. But then God said, teach them discernment to discern God, to discern self, and then to discern others. Very often Christians jump in to discern others before they properly discern God or allowed God to discern them. All right? That's the priority, really, to discern God. John 5:19. The son can do nothing of, him, of himself, but what he sees, there's discernment with the eyes, what he sees the father do, for whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. But you've got to be seeing how? Redemptively. You're seeing, you're seeing past situations as they appear in the natural. Anybody can understand situations in the natural. You've got five carnal senses to tell you what's going on in the natural. But this is a supernatural discernment to where Jesus said, I only do what I see my father doing. And the son does nothing of himself, but whatever he sees, the son does also. Now, that's the seeing. Now the hearing. John 12, 50. Spiritual ears that hear both the nature and the word. The nature must match the word. If you're a note taker, write that down because we've got a lot of people in religion who know the word. But you need to know if you're his sheep and you hear his voice, the hearing requires identifying the nature that's on his word. Got it? Okay. And it says here, John 12, 50, Whatever I speak, just as the Father told me, so I speak. So now we have discernment that is seeing, we have discernment that's hearing, and the one that ministered to me the most when I was a young Christian and no one was talking about discerning of spirits, or when they did, uh, it was in a different context. It was <clears throat> um, primarily from an intercession point of view of principalities and powers and discerning this and discerning that. But for me, I believe that the spiritual man discerns all things. It's for all of life. There's daily discernment. It's not just for a prayer meeting. And God gave me this one, and I loved it because I said, I understand that. Even if nobody else understands it, I understand that. And it was found in, uh, we're, we read it from the, um, Luke 8:46. I'm reading from the Amplified Translation, Luke 8, 46. And this even confused his disciples. But I understood this from the time I was a baby Christian, and so has Jason. Someone touched me, for I perceive healing or virtue flow from me. What do you mean somebody touched you? I'll push him out of the way. Get him out of the way. Quit bumping Jesus or something. You know? No, who touched? Somebody put a demand and it's a pull and I could feel and that word feel is a spiritual feel not of goosebumps that's a physiological feeling goosebumps but this feeling was I feel virtue flow from me and I can tell when I preach I can tell when people are receptive and when they're not and I've always been fortunate if they're not receptive, they usually don't come here. Uh, but the vast majority are very receptive because you, I can feel the virtue flow. So gifting, yes. But gifting requires 
opportunity to be received too, doesn't it? I've seen people try to do deliverance on people. It's, I find it amazing. Without their will, good luck. The will needs to be involved of your participant. Otherwise, we just go around and get everybody saved whether they wanted to or not. Get them saved, delivered. I don't care if you don't want to. I'm going to make it happen. But spiritual eyes, spiritual ears, and spiritual touch. For who touched me? I, I, it's, it's, it's God basically taking and saying, uh, come on, no takers. And somebody's, there's people watching that really have not been taught discernment, mainly because people are not walking in it that much. So yeah, I'm coming out of my gifting, but I'm also coming out of having it developed because you're supposed to develop it. What does, who does milk belong to? Babes. Those who have not yet matured for strong meat, having not developed their senses. Your spiritual senses have not been developed for meat. So uh, God's basically saying, you know what, we're going we're gonna to move, but we got to start with teaching you to discern God. Don't worry about discerning somebody else. Most people, when they say, I discern so-and-so, it's got a spirit of Jezebel. I discern so-and-so. Yeah, well, well, where's the redemption? Are you going to pray for them? Did you fast and pray for them? No, I just judged them. You see, there's a difference between assessing a situation and condemning somebody and basically writing them off without looking for a redemptive solution. Now, everybody doesn't want a redemptive solution. I don't chase after those people. Hmm? You didn't see Jesus chase after anybody when he said, unless you drink my blood and eat my flesh. Uh, many people walked away. He didn't go after them. Oh, please, come on, come on. You misunderstood what I said. They didn't get babied. How about the father and the prodigal? Father didn't run after the father to pull him out of the pig, pig pen, did he? See, we, we think we're being redemptive when a lot of times it's just flesh. When did the father run? It was when the prodigal came to his senses and decided to gradually come back. All right, there's someone you can work with, someone who's willing to come back, someone who's willing to humble themselves. Then you can work with that. And the father runs to them. Now, here's what the Lord was teaching us. On, and you need to understand this. If you're going to grow in spiritual discernment, you know, um, the, the first thing you need to know is that there's levels of this authority. And the first level is the very nature of God. His nature, his essence. What is God? God is love. It must start with his nature. You must know, to know his voice, you have to know his nature when you hear that voice. Otherwise, like sheep, if it's any other voice, we shouldn't listen. We should be like those sheep in that little video where uh, you hear somebody saying the right words, but that's not the shepherd. I'm not even going to bother. I'm going to keep grazing here. I'm not even going to lift my head if it's not the voice of the Lord. His nature and his word must match. That's the second element of authority is his word. But his personhood or his nature, his essence... His nature and His Word match, and you need both. If you have His nature and His Word, then the third level is your conscience. But you know, your conscience is only good as your Word level. If you don't know Him intimately and you don't know the Word, uh, conscience can be misleading, can it? You can condone things that are not okay because you don't know that the Word says they're not okay. So conscience is really a third level of authority. Nature and word are supreme, and they must match. The devil can quote scripture. So you need the nature and the word, then conscience, and then spiritual authority. Well, that'll keep, that'll keep from spiritual abuse from pastors and apostles and prophets and teachers. Guess what? You were called to be a servant leader, and you're on the bottom. The ultimate authority is God's nature and His Word. A person's conscience 
And then, then spiritual authority. You got that? That way you don't, you don't have anybody controlling you other than God. You want to be God-controlled. Lordship is being... Un, nobody can control someone who's under control. Now, this is not an excuse for anarchy. I'm saying nobody is under, can be controlled except one who is under control. And if you're under the lordship of Jesus, the devil can't control you. If you're an anarchist, you basically are being controlled by the devil, the prince of the power of the air. You've got to serve somebody, make a choice. Now, to discern is to distinguish or differentiate. To make a distinction, this is God, this is not. Okay, This is good, this is evil. This is clean, this is unclean. And the first lesson that God taught me in the school of the Spirit, yes, I was gifted, but he taught me to, to, to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of God. And the first thing he taught me, and this is lesson number one, if you get this, you can go leaps and bounds ahead. I'm speaking to new believers now too. New believers, you just received Jesus. He's not an it. He's a person. Deal with the presence of God. And when you touch him, you are touching a person. There's things that you will respond to as a person that you will not respond to if you think it's an it. The tendency is to use an it. A person, though, needs honor and respect. So, lesson number one, God is a person, not an it. And so, uh, when the, I was in the school of the Spirit, believe it or not, God gave me lots of what we called, um, I can still remember a friend of mine, IQ 177, and he used to say, Dennis, you think in grids. Well, I do. Grids. Different little, like, overlays. Uh, but the, they're all based according to a pattern based on a principle that God builds in his word. And the one that he worked with me as a baby Christian was, I'm going to give you a spiritual truth, a reality. Truth is reality. In other words, you're going to know me in that particular word. You're going to know me, the person of that word. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. You've got to see that the word that's living is a person. And he says, I'm going to give you that reality. Then I'm going to teach you how to cultivate that reality so that you grow in it. Like being written on the tablet of your heart. And thirdly, test you or you test yourself to see, do I see a result with that, or is that was I just playing some kind of head game? You know, you can play head games with the Word of God and be very knowledgeable. And God showed me, discernment-wise, here's the counterfeit. The real is, I'm going to give you a reality, a truth from the Scriptures. I'm going to teach you to cultivate it, and it should bear redemptive fruit. Here is false discernment. You treat the Word of God, <clears throat> as an it, it's ink on a page. I treat the Word of God as ink on a page. I'm cultivating, it's an it, it's not a person. It's an it, it's knowledge. I'm cultivating information, and the end result is dead works. Could you see that happening in religion? I'm taking this instruction manual, this Bible, and rather than it becoming a living expression of Jesus to me in reality, it's just an it. <clears throat> I'm going to cultivate this it, and I'm going to study hard, and I'm going to know it inside out and backwards. I'm going to memorize a lot of it, and I'm going to have all this information. And then from this information, I realize I'm required to do something, so I'll, I'll do works. You know, you can do all of that independently from God. That's the counterfeit to discernment. All true fruitfulness must come out of intimacy. Now, 
when God taught me that it, he was a person, the minute I closed my eyes and I felt his presence, and I've shared this many times, I'm enjoying him spirit to spirit. I'm touching, union, communion. I'm enjoying the moment-by-moment -moment relationship, knowing that this is special time, but when I don't go in or out of prayer, when I'm done with my prayer time, this special time, I'm into all the time. Special time, all the time. Anyone that goes in and out of prayer is living a compartmentalized life. And you can, you'll fill it with religion or fill in the blanks. But intimate time is special time. When I come out of that special time, I'm in all the time. Isn't that the way Jesus walked? Didn't he have special time? He had special time where he was alone with his father. But then he also said, I only do what I see. He had a daily discernment walk to where he saw, heard, and felt. Kingdom realm. Now, I learned step number one was that I was going to honor God as a person. And if I was going to honor him as a person, what did the scripture start teaching me? Well, I don't want to grieve him. I don't want to quench. I don't want to resist. Isn't that a good way to have a relationship? I don't want to grieve you. I don't want to hurt you. I don't want to resist you in any way. That sounds like a pretty good relationship, doesn't it? I don't want to grieve. I don't want to quench. And I don't want to resist you. And you know what that cultivates? That cultivates union and communion and respect and honor. And he that honors me, God says, I will honor. And guess what you get? You humble yourself to that, you get more. You want more of his presence? You start with his presence. And God basically says, truth or reality is going to be cultivated and there needs to be fruit. Test yourself to see if it's really working or you're just doing some kind of religious game. Do you see a change in your life? Do you see changed results, redemptive results? And here's what he showed me. With those three things, reality, cultivate that reality, and then test to see if it really worked, if there's any fruit. You got that? If you're a note taker, that's one of my paradigms. But yet, it's a way to where you let the Holy Spirit discern you. And we'll get to that. But first now, we're discerning God. We're going to discern God, self, and then others. And others is last. Trust me, we need to discern God first. Right? Now, if reality is the presence of God, Jesus himself, the person, gets cultivated in my life, the fruit should be basically peace, love, joy. Isn't that the kingdom? Isn't that his rule, evidence of his rule? Should be in an increasing proportion. So I says, well, how do... What, what truth am I actually entering into? If I'm entering into his nature, what is God? God is love. So the truth should be love. How do I cultivate love? So what have you heard from this church from eons when we traveled? We even got tired of saying it, but we saw the need was so great, we didn't get tired of saying it. Unless you forgive from the heart, and unless forgiveness flows out of you as natural as breathing, not a, something that you got to go get alone with God and spend 10 hours trying to forgive somebody, or worse, years or months. Forgiveness, love properly cultivated in everyday discernment means that you walk in a forgiveness lifestyle, that forgiveness flows readily, spontaneously. Not, oh, I don't want to do that. Hey, oh, but you don't know what they did. And then you go into your long little thing, right? But you want to cultivate that intimacy with God. And you know what the funny thing is? It takes less of a toll on you when you learn to cultivate forgiveness promptly. There's something about prompt obedience that makes life go well. People will actually accuse you of never having any problems. We've been accused of that. We could have all kinds of chaos going on in life, but if you respond right, you look like someone who doesn't have any problems. And that makes other people mad that have problems because they want you to whine, complain, murmur like they do. And if they find, and if you're not, and if you're too happy, 
Well, then they'll go find someone else that whines, complains, and murmurs, and they'll feel the compassion. And they'll call it ministry. That's not ministry. I don't want a depressed person praying for me or, or someone who the minute they hear the sermons of God and they, they, they get the Word of God preached to them and then they go out and they start bad-mouthing people. That gossip, you know what? God's going to remove them from the midst. And He's going to leave the humble in the midst. People that, if you're still talking about some situation that happened years ago, you have an unhealthy heart. Very, very unhealthy heart. Because forgiveness should be not only instant, but it should be spontaneous. If you're hanging on to something, what are you hanging on for? It only takes you down. And you know what's even worse? A discerning person can tell that that person's spirit is hanging on to stuff. And you can tell them, let it go. But isn't it up to the individual? You can't make it happen. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> I believe that love is the reality or the nature that we're going to need in such a time as this because everything's going goofy out there. It's like an alternate reality. This is the time for your light to shine and your light, your life, your love to be made manifest needs to be cultivated and you're going to have to go on a forgiveness lifestyle and the end result will be peace. And I know that's a terrible result, isn't it? Most of you know, I'm tired of this peace. Really? You're tired of satisfaction? Because that's what peace will do. Now, <clears throat> here's the mandate God gave us as a church, and I believe that you need to hear this. But in uh, Ezekiel 44, <clears throat> there's a portion of Scripture uh, that I believe God is raising up fivefold ministers to teach people, God's people, discernment. And I don't think it's just fivefold ministers anymore. I think it's every believer should be having cultivated the heart that they have in Ezekiel 44. These are the sons of Zadok. You've heard me talk about this before. But listen to this verse 23 and 24. These sons of Zadok, these people who don't go astray in their heart, they will teach my people the difference between the holy and the unholy, and they will cause them to discern between the clean and the unclean. And in controversy, they will stand as judges and judge according to my judgment. Now remember, when we use that word judgment, there is daily judgment where you assess a situation. That's not the same as judging to where you condemn, just right off. No redemptive solution, just written off. That's condemn. So when it says do not judge, we're talking about do not condemn. We're not talking about do not assess, because you've got to make assessments all day long. You make, you make judgment calls all day long, all right? <clears throat> but discernment <clears throat> is basically something that God once taught to the body, and there's no way to teach it. it. Even We're going to pray an impartation for that gift because it's, for me and Jason it's the strongest and I actually believe uh, Ember's got it. I believe that with all my heart. Little Ember's got it. So it's going to go down generationally. And there's a spirit of wisdom with discernment because it, it makes a distinction between truth and error. Right from wrong. And sometimes people can have arguments that sound so good, but discernment cuts through the argument and says, but the source is wrong. And some people don't like that definition. Uh, it's actually uh, in your uh, spirit-filled King James Bible. It was where I saw it for the first time. It says discernment is to know the source or motive of a particular person or situation. The source, the source, the source. Discernment, we're going to get back to the source. I don't care how good an argument sounds. If the source isn't God, it's a head game. It's like lawyers do this sometimes. They, they will flip on their opinion just to practice, being for something or being against it. But that's all a head game. The source needs to be either God or flesh or the devil. Now, 
the way God rules, and now this is Francis Frangipane definition, and uh, I like some of his stuff on, on discernment, but uh, mine found expression in this. Here's his expression. He says, love in here precedes peace. Peace guard your heart and mind when you're letting love flow. Love precedes peace. It comes before peace. It's the source, the source of peace. And peace allow, precedes your perception. So if love is coming from me, peace is guarding my heart and my mind. My discerner is an operation. And it's very easy then if someone says something nice but it's got a bad source, it'll go It'll resonate against that peace. You don't take it in. Can you see where this needs practice? Because most people, when they hear something negative, if the source is bad, like gossip, they suck it in. And then they get hurt by it. And then they feel bad. Well, guess what? You have the spiritual capacity to bear witness to it without owning it. You have a choice to hear a sermon, put up a wall and not receive it, or open up and receive it. You have that choice. Why not do that with evil? <laughs> if somebody's angry, why not let peace guard your heart and your mind? You will feel the anger, but that, just because you feel it doesn't mean it's in you. It means you're a bearing witness to an atmosphere. Don't become the atmosphere. <laughs> I used to see people... Uh, I remember Cliff and Stina, we were in churches where intercessors would be interceding and all of a sudden something yucky would come up and somebody would be praying for something yucky and people would run out of the room. That's not an intercessor. <laughs> you don't run from yucky stuff going, ooh, that felt creepy, I'm out of here. It's, you're not going to get caught unless you open up and let it come in. Too many people afraid of the devil. Afraid they're going to be contaminated. That's a fear basis, not a faith basis. Bear witness does not mean own it. How about the person who goes, Oh, you must have been hurt. You, you were treated so badly by people. Me too. I was treated so badly. Did hug. That's not discernment and that's not ministry. That's your flesh identifying with somebody else's flesh. That is not discernment. That is not ministry. And boy, did I've seen that in 40-some years of ministry. I've seen fake ministry by people who were basically hurting, didn't resolve their hurts, and they would look for hurting people to commiserate with. Where's the redemption? Where's the solution? If you're hanging with hurting people, you're probably not dealing with your own hurts. You're looking for solace other than in God. You're looking for a false comfort, and you will find it. All right, so God's raising up five-fold ministers, and I believe He's raising up more than five-fold ministers. I believe He's raising up this congregation, Kingdom Life Church, Full Stature Ministries, both people near and far. I'm telling you what, He's raising you up to discern, to distinguish. And we're going to give you some clues now. If you're going to learn to discern God, we already showed you how to develop that intimacy, how to cultivate that intimacy, and how to test yourself to see if you really have what it takes. Is the fruit manifesting? If there's no fruit, wherever there's fruit, there's a root, and that's good for good fruit and bad fruit. A good tree doesn't produce bad fruit. Where there's a root, there's fruit. You see fruit in your life you don't like, there's a root. Now, element number two, we've gotten proficient at learning how to discern God or getting into, into His presence more effectively than ever before. We're enjoying Him as a person. We're cultivating it. We're seeing more peace in our life than we've ever seen. Now we're going to discern self. Oh, I love this one. You know why? Because most Christians call discernment judging their, judging their behavior. 
That is not discernment. Judge your motive. That's discernment. The source, the source, the source. Discernment always doesn't want correct argument or correct answer. With their lips they praise me, but their heart is far from me. God's looking at the heart. Man's looking at the outward appearance, and that includes you. You have a tendency to look at the outward appearance and behavior. God say, let me search your heart for anxious thoughts and hurtful ways. Let me search the heart for the source or the motive. Discernment gets the motive. Now, here's where the Lord trained me from the beginning. Obviously, it's a portion of Scripture everybody knows. Hebrews 4, 12, and 13. For the Word of God, there is, first of all, write this down for note there, there's no discernment accuracy without the Word of God. <laughs> there can be no accurate discernment without the Word of God. His Word and His love nature are one. Now, just as you would say Jesus and His Word are none, I like to say His love and His Word are one. For the Word of God is living and powerful. What's that mean? It's not ink on a page. It's living and it's powerful. It's a person. Are you getting it? And it's sharper than a two-edged sword and it divides soul from spirit. It says, this is flesh, this is spirit. Joints and marrow. And it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents. That's the same as motive. It goes to the source. The Word of God, when it discerns you, goes to your motive. If you really let the Word of God deal with you in your life, and not just learn it in your head so you have a bunch of Bible head knowledge, if you really let it deal with you, you let it go to the heart and check your motive. It wants to discern the thoughts and the intents. What is your intent when you said such and such a soul body? You know what? we got to die to manipulation in the church. It's an embarrassment when it's discernible. And believe me, maybe everybody who don't discern it, but some people do. Manipulation is sin. It's witchcraft. So don't say certain words that are really a cover for you making excuses for yourself to make you look like you shine a little brighter. You don't need to let, you need to let Jesus' light shine brighter. You don't need to shine on your own light, and blow your own trumpet, or whatever you want to call it, because God basically says it's manipulation. Let your yes be yes, your no be no, everything else is from the devil. Whoa. So that means there's a whole lot of watered down excuses. Instead of saying yes or no, you basically made this nice little excuse. It's basically manipulation. Let your yes be yes and your no be no, everything else is of the evil one. What does that mean? It means just what it said. So now I'm letting the word of God discern me, joints and marrow, and it's down there. And guess what? This is the part that revolutionized my life, is God was always teaching me, I'm a person, not an it. I'm not ink on a page. I'm living, powerful, sharp in a two-edged sword. Look what verse 13 did. This settled it for me. It said, there's no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him. All of a sudden, this living word is no longer ink on a page. All things are naked and open to the eyes of him. The Word has to be a person in your life. If you want to be written on the tablet of your heart, He wants to express Himself through you. He doesn't want you to just preach words. He doesn't want you to just quote scriptures. I've seen some of the most hurting people in the body of Christ could quote scriptures left and right. Oh, you're given the right answer, but the heart isn't, doesn't have the reality attached to it. Religion can do that, but the source... Now, Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts and hurtful ways. What, what's happening here? You're actually asking God to discern you. If you don't ask God to discern you, you will do things like, and tell me if you've ever heard this one. Oh, I already know that. 
I've already dealt with that. Those are the people that really don't get too far. That means like, I read the Bible once, why should I look at it again? <laughs> if you use what you have, milk, and this is where I want to challenge Kingdom Life Church and all those that are connected with us, milk is for those who have not developed daily discernment. It's a good place to start. Start with milk. Desire the sincere milk of the word that you might grow. But Hebrews 5 says, For everyone who partakes only in milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Solid food belongs to those who are full age, that is, those who by reason of use. Do you see where this has to be exercised? By reason of use. Not just gifting. And not just using your gifting. But using and developing daily discernment through intimacy. Having their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. In 1 Corinthians 2.15, those who are spiritual discern all things. You know what that tells me? That's not about gifting. Gifting as we understand it in 1 Corinthians 12 are flashes of insight. Nobody walks in a constant word of knowledge. Nobody walks in a constant anything. Flashes of insight. But yet we're called to be sons and daughters of God, to walk in the Spirit and not the flesh. So there is discerning of the spirits as a gifting, but there is discerning of the Spirit that needs to be matured. The spiritual man discerns all things. Well, to discern all things, I can't walk in my gift constantly. I think we need more Brother Lawrence's. Those who practice the presence of God, your discernment will automatically be made much more readily available. It'll be there. You won't be in turmoil. You won't be in chaos. It's actually the opposite of chaos. God's discernment comes in the midst of chaos and brings order out of chaos. We're living in a time of chaos, but direction comes from the Spirit. And when we travel, we saw a lot of fluky things. As soon as people knew that Dennis and Jennifer had a teaching, what do we call it? Uh, discerning of the spirits or something. And as soon as we did that, we had witches show up. We had uh, all kinds of strange people show up and they were all spiritual. <laughs> but uh, the funny thing is, none of them had redemptive solutions. They all had stuff. <laughs> but I didn't, where's the redemption? Where does it draw you closer to Jesus? Where does it provide a redemptive solution? And they, <clears throat> man looks at the outward appearance, God looks at the heart. We know the difference between the spirit of truth and the spirit of error is an aspect of discernment. You know when something's wrong when you hear it? I've read books by Christians and got a bad witness before I finished reading or understood what I was reading. I've read books where I could feel the author may have been a very good man, but he had anger on his writings. There was anger. And what he said, I agreed with in ink. But I'm saying, you know what, really needs to deal with the anger. Motive, the source. You want the source to be, he would have been a lot more redemptive had he gotten dealt with the anger, then wrote the book. It was reactionary rather than responding redemptively to a need. So God's looking basically to discern you and all things are naked and open to the eyes of him. <laughs> now, your spiritual strength is proportional to your level of submission to God. And God's looking to cultivate discernment in you, but here's one thing you would have to die to. Most, underline that word, most supernatural is too quiet for your flesh. There's supernatural that's meant to be demonstrative, but you don't live in that constantly 24-7, but you are expected to live in the Spirit 24-7.
And the only way you can do that is like a weaned child with its mother, David said, I quieted my soul within me. If you can't quiet your noisy mind, will, and emotions, you're going to miss most supernatural. Most supernatural. It's you, you want God to get louder all the time when God wants you to shut up and get quieter. Be still and know that I am God. Morning by morning, I awaken your ear to hear. I'm going to awaken your ear. But that also means your noisy thoughts, your noisy emotions, your noisy will that has to pace, has to do something, has to walk around. That was Dennis. Until God says, sit still until your flesh is weaned. In other words, until my spirit rises on the ascendancy and your flesh submits. <laughs> How's that? It's like I want oh, how the faith camp used to teach it. Put a whip in the in the hands of your spirit man and tell that flesh to behave. It's one way to explain it. Huh? But weaning is basically quieting your flesh. Most supernatural is too quiet for your flesh, and you miss out on an abundant life. If you're just waiting for one supernatural explosion after another, there's going to be periods in between. What are you going to do in the meantime? You're supposed to be enjoying God. You're supposed to be walking in the Spirit. You're supposed to be touching, hearing, and seeing on a regular basis. Now, let's, let's, let's look at discerning this chaos before creation. Let's look at discerning others now, all right? Some of you like this part better. <laughs> How about discerning the disciples before Pentecost? Interesting, huh? The sons of thunder is what Jesus called. <laughs> the sons of thunder became the apostle of love. John. And the disciples judged by outward appearance. Should we call down fire? Jesus said, you don't know what spirit you're of. You don't know what your source of your words is coming from. You think you're saying nice stuff, but you don't know the source. You don't know what spirit you're of. And poor Peter. I bet that was a hard lesson for him to learn. Because one minute, thou art, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. Wow, cool, huh? Flesh and blood didn't reveal this. We should make tabernacle. He goes, get behind me, Satan. You don't know what spirit you're of. Uh, I can remember going through that. I was a baby Christian. They put me on television. And I didn't think the host was asking the right question. So I kind of went on my own little tangent because I was spiritual. And then he told me, you ever do that again and I'll see to it you're not on television anymore. I went home and I cried all the way home. I quit. Christianity. It's too hard. I can't do it perfectly. Like all the rest of you can do it perfectly, but I couldn't. I quit. That was my out all the time. Even, even as a young pastor, I had a resignation in my desk. That was my exit strategy. If these people get too goofy, I'm out of here. I have a resignation until God made me burn it up and say, you'll never, ever, ever say that again. Okay. That, then I felt like, Peter, where would I go anyway? <laughs> you know, really, really, what would I do? No. The disciples didn't understand. Master, it's good for us to be here. Let's make three tabernacles. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Then there was a dispute among them. Who is to be the greatest? <laughs> Do you see any issues here? Huh? But they were discerning. I, I think I should be the greatest. I think you should be second or third. No, no, I think I should be the one. The point is, if when it comes to discerning other people, we do need to have the heart of Jesus before you have the eyes of Jesus. And the heart of Jesus requires you to touch the love and the redemptive purpose of what you're seeing. Jesus saw the dirt. Real discernment sees through the dirt to the gold and the potential. Now, not everybody will let you mine the gold. I've seen the gold in a lot of people, and actually it's a heartbreak because they, here lies someone with great potential, 
but they've never, they're not willing to do anything with it. And many of those have authority problems. They have problems with policemen, pastors, fathers, any male figure. I've seen that over and over again. And it's sad because I saw so much potential in them. But they couldn't release the potential because they had, it's, it's like you have an assignment from God, a plan for welfare, not calamity. And he even gave, we shared this last week, he even sent angels to get you to fulfill your assignment. But you'll be working against God if you don't deal with the blockages in your own heart. Then you're actually proud. And God is resisting you at this point. It's not the devil. God resists the proud, and he gives grace to the humble. So you have to be willing to deal with the roadblocks in you that prevent you from fulfilling your assignment. No. The gift of discernment, you've got to understand you're going to die to judging. Now, when I say die to judging, you want to discern? You're going to die not to assessing. You're going to die to condemning and writing totally off. You don't burn bridges, but on the other hand, you don't chase people because you could spend far too much time trying to make somebody do something that they don't want to do. There are plenty of people who are hungry. Make sure that you use discernment as to who can be helped and who doesn't want help. Come on, mothers. You're, you're the most guilty of this as a rule. You are just like when we dedicated little Ember. That child belongs to God, not the mother. Oh, no, this is where they start throwing stuff at me. They're God's child. You were called to be a steward. That doesn't mean you're a helicopter mom where you hover over that child the rest of your life telling them how they should live. As a matter of fact, until you stop doing that, there's a good chance they're never going to respond because they're going to push away from the push. But it'll break your heart. But I'm not rejecting them. I'm not letting them go. They're not yours. Romans 14.4, we wore that scripture out traveling because we saw it's such a necessary need in the body of Christ. People did not understand ownership and control. Romans 14.4 in the Living Bible, they are God's servants, not yours. They belong to Him, not to you. You getting the message? <laughs> God is able to tell them whether they're right or wrong, and God is able to make them do as they should. You want to see results? Release love that lets go. And many people have difficulty with that terminology, but I know what I'm talking about. Love frees. Love liberates. Love will let you go into sin. doesn't want you to, but it, it can't keep you from doing it. Intercession. The way we prayed and saw results in people's lives that were really in darkness is we prayed that you can't violate somebody else's will, but we could pray, Jennifer and I pray, to push back the powers of darkness from around their minds so that they can make a free will decision without all that outside influence. And then again, it's still that they may make a free will decision without the demonic influence. That's intercession. Not, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for that child. <laughs> Guess what? There's something wrong with the motive. <laughs> I'm going to, she's going to do what I want. He's going to do what I want. It's witchcraft. Oh, man, I have too much stuff. Anyway. You know you have to develop love and forgiveness. Suspicion is the counterfeit. But let's pray for an impartation, because God's going to... This is Jason and I's strongest anointing. It was one... To me, when I was a young Christian, I had to get information out of books. Matter of fact, Dick Iverson uh, had a Bible course on the West Coast, and he was the only one that said it the way I understood it. You, didn't we say 1 Corinthians 12, what? All the gifts are 
flashes of insight. They don't operate constantly, correct? In his Bible school program, he came to the discern, discerning of spirits and said, discerning of spirits, unlike the others, can in some individuals act as almost a constant. That got my antenna. Almost a constant. And I said, I could identify with that because that's the way it was for me. So it can't be all gifting. It can be gifting, but it still needs to be worked out, doesn't it? It still needs to be cultivated. And then I read Watchman Nee. And Watchman Nee said, a broken man. Broken, he didn't mean messed up. He meant that mind, will, and emotions, that outer shell, that soulish nature is broken so that the spirit can come out. He said, a broken man doesn't miss a move in another person's spirit. That's discerning other people. And it's discerning motive, the source. So the next time you compliment me, you better mean it, or I'll know. Huh? Come on, have you ever had somebody compliment you and it didn't feel right? It probably wasn't. <laughs> but then I always gave them the benefit of the doubt and said, while well, they're trying. I had one in my first pastorate where she go, I love you, pastor. And it was like, I love you. And I was thinking, you know, bless her heart, she's trying. That's what you say in the South, right? Bless her heart. Bless her heart, she's trying. She hasn't gotten the victory yet in it. <laughs> There's no love really coming out of her words. So is there a possibility that you could say the right answer enough until your heart changed? Yeah. But I really wish the church would get away from that. That's like going around the mountain until you're worn out. Why not repent, receive forgiveness, and deal promptly? That old method of sanctification is by getting worn out. And then you develop a theology that I have, to, I have to say the right thing over and over again till eventually it'll take. Perhaps. But usually when it takes, it's because you finally surrendered and yielded properly. <laughs> and when you sur but then you don't know when you did it or how you did it. You just know that it worked. So then you form a theology that it must be hard. God will take you by the easiest way you're willing to go. How many want to go the easier way? I, I want to go the easier. I don't want to go around the mountain 30 times until I learn. I don't want water wearing down the rock of my heart. I'd rather just let God break up my fallow ground and then get on with life. You waste too much time the old way. It does work. I've seen plenty of people where it did work. But that's hard. So we're going to pray right now. Are you open? Open? I can tell if you're not. Yeah. I want to release an impartation. And what it'll do is it'll cause you to be conscious. Your conscience will be more sensitive to truth and error, clean and unclean, right and wrong. Do you want that? All right, then. I receive right now. I open up my heart for a fresh impartation of discerning of spirits. I want to be more sensitive and aware in my conscience to clean and unclean, to truth and error. I want to know in my knower whether I see, hear, or feel. I want to feel the virtue flow from me. I want to see what God's doing in a situation when all chaos is breaking out around me. I want to learn to hear what he's saying in the midst of, of many voices. There's the voice of the city. There's the voice of the news. There's the voice of the temple. There's the voice of religion. And there is the voice of God. And I want the voice of God and I want to discern the difference. I'm not listening. My God is not CNN or N NBC or ABC. My main, uh, I'm not not listening to their voice. I'm listening for the voice of God as to what the instruction is. And so, Father, right now, uh, I'm not even listening to the voice of religion because religion has a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, works that are dead and the source doesn't have life. 
God is living, and I want to feel that life when I read His Word. I want to receive His Word, and I want to see, hear, touch, see, hear, touch, see, hear, touch. I want to uh, have all three submitted in such a way that the Word of God is, gets written on the tablet of my heart, and I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that it's living, powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. It's dividing me asunder. And I'm going to close with this, that you know, as many of you received it, you received it. Now seal that work right now by the power of the Holy Spirit. Write it on the tablet of my heart and I will be promptly and spontaneously obedient to the, to the stirrings of my heart. The clean versus the unclean. And we thank you for this in Jesus. Boy, there's a nice, there's a nice blanket upon you. I really believe at Kingdom Life Church people, you're not going to be fooled you're not going to be sold a bill of goods by anybody's uh, quick talking. No con artists. You're going you're gonna to know there's something erroneous in what they're saying, even if the words are good. And you're going to look for a redemptive solution. You want the eyes of Jesus. You've got to have the heart of Jesus. You've got to see through. You've got to see through circumstances as they appear to see what God's doing. It's a tale of two kingdoms. Kingdoms of chaos and darkness and the kingdom of the son of his love. That's where we were translated. That's where we need to stay. And so we, we embrace a new sensitivity to the Holy Spirit, a new level of discernment. In Jesus' name. Matter of fact, if you have a prayer partner, you can practice with somebody. And basically say, now this is just practice. This is not gospel. But I felt like when you were talking that there was a push or when you were talking you were hurting a little bit. Is that right? You know, submit it for scrutiny. If you've got a friend that you can do that with, it's wise. Well, when you were telling me about your boss, I felt, I felt frustration. Is that true? The words you said weren't that bad about the boss, but I could feel frustration. Is that true? Let me, let's pray you through that frustration. That's a friend. I would start out with an agreement to talk like that though first. <laughs> Otherwise you're gonna, you're gonna get some of you are gonna come in with black eyes the next Sunday. Don't solicit your gifting. <laughs> Build relationship and honesty and openness with one another. Right? Husbands and wives, you have no excuse. You should be doing that. You might not like the answer you get, but you should be doing that anyway. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.